our lives depended on it because they do Lord oh draw us to you tonight in this service Lord 
Oh, have your will and your way tonight, Lord. We love you, Father God. We praise you, Lord. We surrender all to you right now, Lord God. Jesus, how much you love him, amen, because he's just so good, Lord, we bless your holy name, my God, you're great, you're good, you're kind, Lord, we thank you for all that you are and all that you've done, Lord, just move tonight in our service, I pray, Lord God, you anoint your word, anoint your messenger, Lord Jesus, Lord, we surrender all to you, in the name of Jesus, we pray. I'm so glad to see all of you back tonight. I trust that you had a blessed afternoon. Right now, uh, you, well, I don't know if they've already handed out the sheets or not, but all the children, you're going to be receiving sheets to fill out while I'm preaching to keep up with what I'm saying. And you may learn more than me before it's all over. Amen. That's all right. I want to preach a message tonight that's close to my heart. It's entitled, That I May Know Him. That I may know him. Boy, what a word this could be. Amen. When God's people come together in unity, we're seeking his face. When people have prayed and asked the Lord to reveal a word for the hour, this word right here tonight can really shake your soul. That I may know him. Would you say that with me tonight, the title of the message? That I may know him. Let's say it one more time. That I may know him. That is my desire. You know, Brother Ricky, I have listened to many messages over the years. I've heard preachers from decades ago that have recorded sermons. And over and over and over and over, I keep hearing the same theme. They want to know him. Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11, speaks specifically to this thought. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus. My Lord, who, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Read that next verse, the entire verse 10 with me. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. I, I kind of caught you off guard there, so I'm going to get you to help me. <clears throat> verse 10, let's all read together. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Thank you. Verse 11 reads, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now, I don't know how many of you went to college, but if you did, I imagine, unless you received a scholarship or Pell Grant, you probably forked out some money, or your parents did. I look at tuition now as our daughters are getting older, and it amazes me how expensive some colleges are. And of course, we look at our daughters and say, you better get a scholarship. <laughs> you want to get a scholarship, amen. It is amazing, the cost. Not just financially, but it's it's mind-blowing the amount of time we set aside to educate ourselves. You see, we go from kindergarten to 12th grade, most of us that weren't homeschooled, if we went to public school, we go every, almost every day of the week besides summer and, of course, weekends. And we uh, spend hours upon hours of our time, and then once we graduate and we turn the tassel, we throw that hat, get all excited, go have a party with our friends, then we say, okay, now we're going right back, except we're going to a different school, going to university. And we spend more money and we spend more time. Why would we possibly ever want to do that? And, and as I'm preaching, please know that I condone going to college, going to school, be, be faithful, pursue as much education as possible. But I want to add this. 
that we spend so much time pursuing, pursuing, pursuing. Why is it? It's because there is an inclination in human nature that says, I want to know more. I want to learn. Now, if you're like me, there were certain subjects in school you could have cared less about taking. Amen? There's some subjects you were like, why in the world am I taking this? I'll never use it. And I know we felt that way. I heard an amen back there. I know we felt that way about certain things. There are things in chemistry I remember taking that I have never used my entire life. There's some things uh, that I learned, biology and, and other, uh, maybe uh, trigonometry. Oh, boy. I remember taking trigonometry. You, you know what? How much I've learned, or I'm sorry, how much I've used from most of my math about, well, addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, percentages. And if you can get those five, you've got a lot of what you'll use. Amen. There aren't many th cereal boxes that I go and look at and I have to figure out a fraction to make sure that I, I'm going to uh, get enough quantity for the money. I just divide. Hallelujah. Again, I'm not speaking against education. I'm trying to make a point that we pour so much of ourselves into learning more things. If we tonight were to have a way to calculate all the time and all the money we have spent for education, how would that compare to the amount of time we spent trying to know God? Hmm. Pastor, I, I really don't like the awkward silence after that question. Let's move on. How much time have we spent trying to know him and the power of his resurrection? I admire those who are able to pursue a doctorate degree, master's degree, but I ask you even more so, how much are you willing to put into knowing God? When I think about people that we know, it usually uh, centers around our family. Parents, children, children, spouses we tend to know them more than almost anyone else on earth why is that it's because we know what makes them laugh and what makes them cry we know what excites them and we know what frightens them you know some of the things that cause us to know them better is because we've spent christmas eve with them and we remember the excitement before christmas morning especially if it's your brothers or sisters or your children we've seen them perhaps go through mourning from a death of a loved one. And we've been right there beside them because we were family. We know people because of our experiences with them, what we go through with them, both the good and the bad. We know them because we have argued with them over which restaurant to go to after church or maybe at night after work. We know them and know their preferences with television because it's usually not what your preference is at a certain hour of the day. That's why we have TVs in every room with DVR now. Can I get an amen? Well, if you don't want to watch what I'm going to watch, I'm going to go to my bedroom. It's so funny. When I was a child, for some reason, we didn't have that option. It was like whatever daddy and mama said, we was going to watch it. And many times they would allow us to watch certain things to, uh, until bedtime, which was wonderful. But you know people because of what you go through with them. The Apostle Paul had a long list of, of accomplishments. He could, could have said, well, I, I was a Pharisee. I followed the law to a T. Didn't break any of them. He could say that he fasted when he should have and he dressed a certain way. He could mention all the accolades that perhaps he had gained as a Pharisee, but he said of all these things, even though he'd been saved, sanctified, filled with heaven's sweet Holy Ghost, as the old-time saints used to say, yet, he said, but my desire is that I may know him. Amen. See, it doesn't matter how much you have pursued God. There should always be a desire in you that says, I want to know him more than I knew him yesterday. I want to know him more tomorrow than I know him today. Amen. Centuries ago, <clears throat> if you'll remember with the history of Israel and, and uh, Judah, I was about to say Judea, it was later when Jesus was on earth, but with Israel and Judah, there were kingdoms and kings, and many of the kings fell astray. They would um, not follow the law, and we remember the times that God would allow enemies to come in and raid them and sometimes even haul them off as slaves and carry them in captivity. And during one of these periods of time, there was a man, a prophet by the name of Elijah. And it was important 
that every prophet of God heard from God because people hung on every word you spoke as a representative of God. And on this particular time, we go to 1 Kings chapter 19. And Elijah was waiting on a word from the Lord. We begin with verse 11. Then he said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. And suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Elijah was so in tune with God's voice that he waited through all of the lookalikes, all the similarities, all the things that could have thrown him off his course. He could have ran after the fire or the wind or the earthquake and said, Well, surely that must be God. And how easy, friend, has it been in your lifetime to see things happen and say, Surely that must be God. But God is testing your discernment. and He's saying, I want to make sure that you're not distracted by the things that look like me. Because there's a lot of signs, so-called signs, that we can receive that are not from God. And I'm one that firmly believes when God is in something, he'll give you peace to do it. Amen. There'll be no second guessing. People may second guess you, and you may have a lot of doubters. But when God tells you to do something, there will be peace. Amen. He still speaks peace, be still, to those who will follow his will. Amen. He wrapped his face in a mantle, and he went out and waited on the Lord. I want to ask you tonight, what is your greatest desire? What's the most important thing when you're not in church, when you're out uh, enjoying life at home, um, at work, wherever you are, in your vehicle? What is the most important thing to your life, in your life right now? And I would ask, is God in it? Is God part of it? Are you shaken by earthquakes and and are there strong winds that come through uh, where that you say well well i'm excited about this but i must ask you the thing you're most excited about right now is god in it because god needs to be at the forefront of everything that's important to us if you're going to know god it's going to take some things number one it's going to take commitment you need to be ready to stick with it you know everything you've accomplished is because you did not give up That makes sense, doesn't it? Everything you do and you accomplish is because you didn't quit. So God expects the same. He wants commitment. Number two, you've got to sacrifice some things in order to know him. Sacrifice. Number three, you will be required to become like him in order to know him. Ooh, that's a tough one. You've got to be more like him if you want to know him. Mm, Because he draws close to those who draw close to him. (laughs) Hallelujah. You must be unapologetic about who he is if you want to know him. I'm going to give you an example. You ready? Some of you said, boy, I sure hope he does. Unapologetic. You work at Walmart temporarily. You're the temp. Temporarily holiday work. Okay, holiday help. Y'all stay with me. You know for a fact that the pots and pans are on aisle 42. Customer comes walking through, walks up to another person who just happens to be wearing that nice Walmart um, smock, I guess that's what they used to call them at Food World, smock with the big bright sun on the back. And they said, do you know, sir, where the pots and pans are? And he says, yeah, they're on aisle 14. You face a dilemma. You can either interrupt and say, no, you're wrong. They are absolutely on aisle 42. I know it. I've seen it. I've even stocked it. I know they're on aisle 42. Or you can be one who stands by and says, well, I'll let them go find out for themselves. And maybe they'll look up and just wander over to aisle 42. Or the third option could be you could agree with the person and say, you know what? I think you're right. I believe they are on aisle 14. And then you're all in unity. You're wrong, but you're in unity. See, when you know God, you need to know him in an unapologetic way. There will, there will always be people who come up with their own religions, their own beliefs, and they'll tell folks who are looking for the truth, they'll tell them it's on this road. It's through Islam. 
It's through Hinduism. It's uh, following after different types of beliefs. Buddhism. They're all kind of uh, beliefs. And we can stand by and watch them find their way, hopefully, to Jesus. We can dispute them and say, no, I know the truth, and there is but one way, and his name is Jesus Christ. Or we can come into agreement with those who are following a different God and say, let's just all get along. At least we won't fight if we come into agreement, and the person still will not find their way. You must be unapologetic about serving God if you're going to know God. You can't apologize for knowing that 5 plus 5 equals 10. Sir, I'm so sorry to have to tell you that 5 plus 5 equals 10. I really apologize. I'm so sorry to have to tell you that. How goofy would that be? It's the truth. Why are you apologizing? Amen? I'm, go back to that scenario at Walmart. Sir, it's, I'm going to tell you the truth. The pots and pans are on aisle 42. But I'm so sorry I told you that. I, I just apologize. I know it doesn't go along with what that other gentleman said. I'm just so sorry. Why are you sorry? You're meeting the need. You're directing the person in the right uh, position where they're trying to reach. Amen? Why should we ever apologize about being Christians, about being, oh, here comes one in words, holiness. I'm not talking about demanding people dress a certain way. I'm speaking of demanding a lifestyle that God demands. Not Michael, not Pastor Michael. That God demands a lifestyle of holiness. It wouldn't hurt for me to preach a little strip right here about old time holiness, amen? Again, I'm not speaking about ritual or tradition. I'm speaking of sanctifying yourself unto God so that you can present yourself a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto him in a way that you're not ashamed if Jesus showed up when you were playing in your video game blowing people's guts out he wouldn't be ashamed if he showed up and you were watching certain movies and they're cursing his name every five seconds he wouldn't be ashamed if he walked up when you're on your phone looking on the internet or on your computer at home and nobody's around you wouldn't be ashamed when he walked in because you had set yourself apart unto the Lord see it's wonderful to live in a sanctified way because you never have to be ashamed you know one of the worst things in the world is for you to be doing something ungodly and you know it's not right and one of the church folks shows up not that they find out what you're doing but they come up and they start talking about oh here it comes Jesus that can make you so uncomfortable because the first thing that hits you conviction runs up and down your spine and you say oh Lord Jesus forgive me you're trying to close your eyes and, and look around and turn your head and, and pray the prayer of repentance before you keep up the conversation because next thing you know they're asking you to pray for them you're like oh Lord I gotta repent before I pray when you live sanctified unto God, you don't have to pray a prayer of forgiveness before you lay hands on the sick and watch them recover, amen? You don't have to hop in the car or in the truck on the way to sister so-and-so's house that's dying on her deathbed and say, Lord God, forgive me of what I did last week so that I can at least pray the prayer of faith. You don't have to do that when you're living a sanctified life. And I don't care how modern or up-to-date we get or how cool we become as a church. My Lord God's trying to say something tonight. No matter how progressive we become, we must never progress beyond God because God is always to be one step ahead of us. As I spoke about this morning, the Lord is driving. He is he leading and guiding the church. And he's saying that although I want you to reach the masses with technology, internet's great, satellite's wonderful, and the mass production of the whole Holy Bible selling by the billions. It's wonderful. But he says you must never step away from that old standard of holiness where that the world looks at you and they see more of me than they see of you. They see more of Jesus than they do of whatever your name is. My God, the Lord is trying to wake up the church and to say live holy as unto the Lord because only those who live holy, who walk in holiness, shall see God. Mm, you won't hear that in every church, amen? But it's still the truth. I don't get caught up on a bunch of rituals, but I still believe the core meaning of what God taught us in his word, that holiness starts with the heart. And it, it affects what you do on the outside. It does affect how you dress, amen? You're not going to walk around, oh, Lord, help me. Mm, I don't want to mess anybody's minds up, so I'm going to be careful right there. But you're going to dress in a way that would bring glory unto the Lord. Amen. If you're really in communion with him, you're going to make sure you dress in ways that bring him glory. Hallelujah. If people come to church 
and they're more concerned about folks looking at them than looking at him, then there's something that needs to change. Amen? I'll move on. He said, secondly, and the power. He said, I want to know him. And the power of his resurrection. There's a graveyard right close to our house, Old Harmony Baptist Church, and there's a graveyard, and there's some plots, um, graves from people who fought in the Civil War. It's amazing. Some of the tombstones are so old, they're, they're kind of crumbling, falling apart. And the last thing that I think of, I mean, unless I'm being spiritual, when I visit a graveyard, the last thing I'm thinking of is, man, this place is where it's happening. I mean, we're going we're gonna to order some Papa John's, going to bust out the Cokes and the Pepsis and the Dr. Peppers. Man, this is where it's happening. Bring on the strobe lights. We're going to have a party tonight. The graveyard is not a place associated with power or excitement or moving forward. It is the opposite. It is a place of memories, a place where people come and they'll stand at a grave. They'll leave flowers. Some people try to talk to the lost soul. I'm not up here to say you can do that. I'm just saying that's something people do. <clears throat> They'll try to talk to the person that's passed on. It's a place where they're seeking healing, but it's, it's a place of the past. And there's no moving forward from that plot. The person, at least the body, is buried. The person is dead. They're either with the Lord or in hell. That's something else not too popular. <laughs> Hallelujah. Everybody, you know everybody goes to heaven, don't you? Every funeral I've been to, everybody goes to heaven. <laughs> kind, of, kind of confuses me as a preacher. The graveyard is a place of the end. How many of you have watched a movie in the last seven days? I'm about to say, man, y'all must have been on your knees. I've been praying and fasting, Pastor. <laughs> Woo! We've been having revival at the house. Well, praise the Lord. I watched a movie last week. Oh, Lord. Lord help me. Especially the older movies, I remember they would say the end. Now, some of the newer movies, you know, they'll just cut it off and you're like, give me something else, please. Is this a cliffhanger movie? Is there a part two? I like the movies that have good endings. That's why I think I like Hallmark Christmas movies because they always got a good ending. Everybody comes together at the end. They just love each other. Hallmark Christmas movies. The end. The end tells me that I really don't have anything else to look forward to. Now, some of the Marvel movies, the um, Avengers, you know, you'll hang around and watch. After all the credits, they'll show a few more clips. Anybody familiar with that that watches those worldly movies? <laughs> Any of you watch them worldly movies? And you'll get a clip at the end, and you're like, oh, yeah. That's showing what's coming up next. But most movies end with the end. The hero has done his thing. The blockbuster moment, the fight, the, the car chase, it's over. It's the end. When Jesus was on the cross, he even said these words, it is finished. But to the saint, the graveyard has a little bit different meaning. And that, those words, the end, have a special meaning compared to what the world sees them as. Because when I see a graveyard, I think about <laughs> the power of his resurrection. It reminds me that there was a Savior who was in the ground. He was in the tomb. A big rock rolled over the face of it as serving as a door. A Roman seal placed upon it. Don't you touch it or you die would have been the judgment call of, that, uh, of anyone who were to break that seal. And yet on the third day, an angel decided he was going to ignore the seal. He breaks it, rolls that stone, sits on it, and waits for somebody to come up so he can tell them the gospel. The Lord is risen. He's not here. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Hallelujah. They had revival in the grave. Graveyard. And Paul said, I don't want to just know him. I do want to know him. But he says, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. You see, Jesus shook up the norm. He took a place known for death, the end, end of story, no more hope, no more vision, and he took that place of the cemetery and turned it into a party. He turned it into, mm, Lord Jesus, he turned it into a place where we can shout instead of weep. It became a place of hope instead of despair. It was a place where that we said, there's coming a day where every Christian in this cemetery, my Lord, when the trumpet sounds and the voice of the archangel cries out and Jesus comes with a shout, every saint of God in that cemetery will 
come bursting out of the earth, transformed into a new body like as unto the Lord. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And the Bible says, forever we shall be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Now, buddy, there's a movie ending for you. Matter of fact, that ending is just the beginning because then we're stepping into eternity and we've got a great, great life to look forward to. Well, praise the Lord. What happened at the resurrection? Matthew 28, 2. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. I want to relate this to what I just read to you about Elijah. Because these were great events. The earthquake, the angel rolling the stone, appearing with bright, glistening robes. Amazing things happening, but yet the most important thing had not happened. All these things were similar to the earthquake and to the wind and to everything that Elijah saw, but it was not until he heard the still, small voice. And when I go back in time, Brandon... And I see the angel and the stone rolled away and the soldiers just falling as dead men because of the power of God. The most amazing moment is when a woman named Mary begins asking this man who looks like a gardener, where have you placed him that I may go find him? And he says this one word in a still small voice, Mary, immediately she recognized when he said her name. Ooh. Mm, how long has it been since you heard God say your name? When's the last time you got still enough, got quiet enough, and got alone with God, and you heard him call your name? I'm going to tell you right now, when God calls your name, it rocks your world. It moves every stone out of the way between you and him. It causes your problems that you have to fade away. The things that are priority in your life get shifted when you hear God speak your name. When does God speak your name it's when you have an intent desire that God I want to know you and the power of your resurrection when we seek him in that way he'll reveal himself let's look right quick at Paul he was formerly known as Saul and he heard words on the road to Damascus he never dreamed he would hear he was on his way there to persecute Christians throw them in jail maybe have them killed and he heard some words there was a bright light that shone upon him. Some say he fell from his horse. I've tried to research as much as I can. We can't really get it in concrete if he did that, but we know he went to the ground. And as he tried to see, he was able to detect that there was one there that he knew was the Lord. Didn't really know who he was, but he said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I am Jesus, whom you persecutest. How hard it is to kick against the pricks, he said. In other words, what you're doing is bringing damage to your own body, on, to your own soul, your own spirit. Don't you even see what you're doing? So here's Saul. His name would be changed to Paul. And he's hearing the words he never expected, that he was actually fighting against the very God he thought he was protecting. He thought he was standing up for Jehovah God, but he was fighting against God's son, Jesus. What a sad moment this was. To Paul, it was revealed that his life had been like a graveyard. Jesus addressed this in Matthew 23, verses 27 through, 30, uh, through 28. Before Jesus died on the cross, he said this to the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanness. Even so also outwardly appear righteous to men. He said, you do appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Without Jesus, Paul was just a whitewashed tomb filled with dry bones. But Jesus showed up on the road to Damascus to rock his world. Hallelujah. Paul had met Jesus on the road. He had been healed from blindness that took place because of the great light that shone that day. Ananias, a disciple, came up and laid his hands on him, prayed under the, uh, unto obedience unto God, and God opened up his eyes. It was like scales fell from his eyes. Paul had been saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. All these things. But still he said, that I may know him. That I may know him. There are preachers today who have pastored churches for 30 to 40 years. And their heart's desire is still this. 
I just want to know him. They've seen great accomplishments, many saved. Healings in their altars, people filled with the Holy Ghost, and I could say the same for here. We've seen so much of that. And yet my heart's cry is not for a bigger building, even though there are certain things that come along with growth. My heart's cry is not that our tithe, uh, tithing increases to double what it is now, even though that would be fine. My desire is to know God Amen. and to preach messages under the anointing of the Holy Ghost that are so divinely inspired that every person who hears the words of these messages will begin to have a burning inside them like the men who walked on the road to Emmaus with Jesus, those two disciples. And when he would talk with them, it got to a place where they could no longer open their mouths. They were saying, have you not heard? Where you been? Don't you know what just happened in Jerusalem? But as Jesus began talking, they stopped talking and they listened and they met, into, they met in a house, the Bible says in the book of Acts, and broke bread. And when they saw him break the bread, they knew instantly this was not just an ordinary man. This was that same Jesus who died on a cross and rose from the dead and when they knew who he was the Bible says he disappeared from their midst but later when they would go to Jerusalem and explain to the disciples what had just happened they said did not our hearts burn within us as he spoke the word it was because of the anointing on the word and on the messenger that they burned on the inside. And my Lord, I pray that every person who attends New Haven Church of God will begin to burn fervently on the inside. I know it would be fun to come together and just fellowship and sing a few songs and hear a happy sermon, and there's plenty of those. And I know it would be fun to shake hands and meet at our houses and have get-togethers, and that's fine. But what I really desire is to have a church, and I know we're headed this way, to have a church that burns hot on the inside and say, did not our hearts burn as he broke that bread, as he spoke the word tonight? Honey, do you remember when the pastor or when the evangelist or the teacher said that today in Sunday school? My heart burned within me because it's not just another lesson, my Lord. It's not just another song. It's not just another testimony, but it's the word of God coming from the mouth of an anointed vessel. And God desires for every one of us to get to a place where we say, God, my first priority is to know you and the power of your resurrection. Philippians 3.10 continued, and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. I'll be the first to admit that I'm used to having a life of moderate comfort I've been overseas once I've seen how life is in a certain country it still wasn't even any comparison to the way it is in Africa and India and some places I've went to places like Atlanta and seen homeless folks pushing buggies down sidewalks and people living under bridges and sleeping in clothes that they probably worn for six seven days straight we've seen people standing on curbs near Walmart here in Atala saying, well, work for food. Anything you can do for my family would be a blessing. And I look at them, and I look at myself, and I look at you. And I say, overall, we're fairly comfortable. My children, and I hope yours, have never gone to bed hungry. Now, some of them might eat like little piglets, and you finally say, you ain't eating another bite. And they might think they're hungry, but you know where I'm going, that we have enough nourishment to keep us healthy. If our family members get sick most of the time, we can take them to a doctor or go buy something over the counter. So when we talk about suffering, it's so difficult, Brother Jonathan, to convey to a church what it really means to suffer. Even for your beliefs, religious beliefs. We were heading in a bad way. Yeah, I'll get political. Ooh. We were heading down a very dark road. Matter of fact, if you've been with me more than two years, you know where I'm going right now. If certain people had gained control of Washington, D.C. and the White House, you would see a whole different story right now with religious freedom because those people have the authority over the Department of Justice, the Department of Education, and I could go on and on at appointing uh, judicial nominee or making judicial nominations and uh, making certain appointments even to the Supreme Court. I'm here to tell you, church, hear me well. 
God himself has heard the prayers of his bride, and he has intervened in the United States of America for a season. So now that I made that statement, we got another one over here, a relative of Hope, who I greatly admire, Judge Roy Moore. And I firmly am standing behind him. I know that uh, I don't usually go all out and try to push a candidate, but I stand with that man. I don't know everything about him. Nobody's perfect. I, I'll go ahead and admit that. We don't know everything. But I'll tell you this. He stands for the word and the truth. And I've been to his rallies, and I know that he's a man of God. I believe it. He's a man of God. And I've also seen where it looks like the devil himself has come like a, like a roaring lion trying to destroy that man just because of his stand for Jesus Christ. So now that I got political, let me say this. We are so blessed in America in a way because we've been so comfortable. But on the other hand, I say I'm concerned that our comfort has caused complacency. Imagine if you were under threat of being imprisoned for showing up at New Haven tonight. We'd really know who was legit, wouldn't we? I'm not saying you just want a purpose to go to jail. I mean, you'd probably try to meet somewhere where you wouldn't get arrested. But I am saying this, that the things that, I'm trying to think how to word it correctly. The threats against us sometimes push us to become greater. The dangers before us sometimes force us to grow. And I don't know how much longer we'll have the freedoms we have. I thank God for them. I do. But the spirit of Antichrist is rising and it's gaining strength. And it amazes me the things that people are standing for now. Some of the nominees that President Donald Trump presented for particular positions <clears throat> were attacked by Bernie Sanders and some others because they were Christian. And he said, didn't you say in the past that Muslims were not going to go to heaven? It was only through Jesus? And they're like, well, absolutely Yes, absolutely right. Well, I don't think you're fit to serve as blank, whatever position. And I'm thinking, Lord Jesus, help us that we're headed down a road of anti-Christian principles. And the only thing, and see, here's what excites me about this generation of teenagers now. I don't know if you've noticed, but we've got teenagers in New Haven who are working in positions. They're helping with media. They're overseeing nursery sometimes. They help hand out, a lot of times when you see these um, papers handed out to the children, they hand those out and then give out the candy after the kids turn them in, children turn them in. They help with children's church a lot of times as assistants. Sometimes you may see them up here on stage. They, matter of fact, let me brag on them a little bit. There were some that today were even working on a drama, and if you weren't able to be here, you'll have a chance to get plugged in with that because we're trying to work it out for where you can come to practice. But already we got some excited about doing a drama with our youth group. And what excites me, Brother David, is that regardless of how many laws are passed or how much of our beliefs are made illegal, there is a generation of young people that are rising up that God is filling with the Holy Ghost, that are getting on fire, and they're saying that if, even if you were to lock me up and try to shut me down, I will speak the truth even unto death because it is their desire to know him and the power, my Lord, to know him and the power of his resurrection. Mm, Lord Jesus, I gotta hurry. I gotta hurry. What are the benefits of experiencing the power of Christ's resurrection? Number one, in his resurrection lies our, in other words, it is gained from his resurrection, our justification. That means God sets you at a place where you are now looked upon as righteous. You are made right in the sight of God. You are justified. Romans 4:25. I'll move quickly. Who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for what? Our justification. Yeah, I don't see it up there. Maybe I didn't put it on there. Number two, in the, the resurrection, there is sanctification. Let's go to Romans chapter 6, verse 4. There it is. Romans 6, verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Number three, resurrection causes us to have a gateway to the empowerment of, of the Holy Ghost. Anybody thankful for the Holy Ghost? Yes, hallelujah. 
Do you know who you just pleased when you said that? Or raised your hand? The Holy Ghost. Amen. Did you know he's in the room right now? Yes, Do you know the Spirit of God lives inside of every believer? Now there's a baptism that comes uh, separate from that. There's a complete baptism from head to toe, my Lord. <laughs> Woo! with the evidence of speaking in other tongues and gifts of the Spirit. But I'm here to tell you, the Spirit of God lives in every believer. You couldn't even say Jesus is Lord without the Spirit of God, the Bible says. Tell me about that empowerment. I will. John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given. Why is that? Because Jesus was not yet glorified. So what that tells me is because of the resurrection. The Holy Ghost was now able to come and fill us. Number five, there's a physical transformation that comes because of the resurrection. Romans 8, 11, but if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, oh, what'd that just say? What did that just say? Cortland, did you hear that? Did you hear that? It said if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells. Mm -hmm. You know I get excited about that. I, I have to be so careful because I'll go on an evangelistic streak for about 30 minutes. If I'm not careful, I have to hold back because I get so excited to know that the same Holy Ghost who was there at the tomb and quickened the mortal body of Jesus Christ and resurrected it unto newness of life now lives, woo, now dwells inside of us. Mm, move on, let's go. Now, number six, resurrection power gives us access to realms of unlimited revelation. Luke 24, 45. After Jesus had risen, here's what he did, and he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. His resurrection allowed us to have greater understanding. Every time we experience God reigning over us or his anointing flowing through us or his gifts working, as ministry through us, we're experiencing the power of his resurrection. Every time we seek the face of God by spending time with him in our prayer closets, we are joining with Paul in saying that I may know him. We gain access to many things in this world based on who we know. Have you ever had favor on earth because of who you knew? Did your parents ever help you to maybe make more money or get a better job? Did, did someone help you? to rise the, the ladder of success, there had to be somebody because it's almost impossible just to do everything on your own. The same thing applies to eternity. You only get to enjoy eternity based on who you know. It's not based on your merit, your accomplishments, your actions, your successes. It's based on do you know him Amen. and the power of his resurrection. If you know Jesus, then God's going to bless you throughout all eternity. But the only way you get access through those gates of pearl is if you have a relationship with Jesus. Stand with me, church. Stand with me tonight. Philippians 3 and 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Let us pray. Oh, God. I know I've got to be careful how I pray sometimes, but I, I just want to say forgive me. Forgive me, Lord, for not seeking you with all my heart at certain points. God, I've been more concerned with entertainment, more concerned with making money and supporting my family. I ask for forgiveness for that, Lord, although those things are important. But, Lord, as I stand before this church as a human, a mortal, one who is imperfect, I realize that people in, in these, between the seats are in that same place. They're imperfect. They're mortal. They battle with the flesh between flesh and spirit, just like I do. But God, I'm asking you put a, a branding iron on our souls tonight. I ask, Lord God, you place a lasso, a rope around us and begin pulling us to a place where that our full focus is on knowing you and the power of your resurrection. Lord God, gather our thoughts. Lord, there are imaginations that torment us sometimes, but Lord, help us to place them, to cast them down, put them underfoot, and to completely focus on knowing you and the power of your resurrection. My God, when we come back Sunday, 
Lord, when we meet Sunday morning, I am going to be able to detect who has made a decision to seek you with all their heart. Because, Lord, this, this church will become a different church because of the people seeking your face. Lord, help me to lead that charge. I pray this week, God, that I'll seek you like never before. Move us, motivate us, push us, God. Lord, even if you have to appear before us, whatever it takes, my God, time is too short for us to goof off, play games, and act like we've got forever on this earth. My Lord, draw us closer. Pull us, beckon us, convict us where we need it. Help us, O oh Lord, to seek your face. I pray in Jesus' name. Would you take just a moment and lay your hand on the shoulder or the back of the person closest to you if you feel comfortable with that? If you're married to them, I wouldn't mind if you want to hold their hand. That's fine. Would you pray for that precious individual? Some of them are going through battles you don't even know about. Some of them are right on the brink of amazing victories. Miracles are right around the corner. But maybe they just need a little bit more strength. Oh, Lord, I speak over the church right now. My God, I pray over every person in the congregation. Lord, renew that fervent desire in us to serve you first. Lord, don't let distractions get in the way. I pray, Lord, that nothing will divide us. There'll be nothing to distract us. Unite us in you, Holy Spirit of God. You are a unifying spirit. You are a peaceful spirit. And I pray, Lord, that we... My God, I pray you unite your body. And help us, Lord, to be intent on pleasing you. Oh, we love you, Lord. Thank you for allowing us to live in America. Thank you for our freedoms. And oh, God, I pray we'll use that freedom to reach the lost. Lord, help our voice to go around the world. Speak through us, Lord. Minister through us. Touch our children in this congregation, our teenagers. My God, guard their hearts and their minds. Lord, there are battles they'll face we've never faced before. Lord, but I thank you that no weapon formed against our youth and our children will prosper. Oh, Lord, I thank you, God, that your anointing is being placed and your mantle is being placed upon their heads, their shoulders, and that, God, they will become great, valiant warriors for the kingdom. My Lord, I thank you not just for the youth and the, the children. I speak over every adult in the name of Jesus Christ. My God, I pray there be an empowerment of the Holy Ghost that begins to move over them. Lord, I pray you anoint their words, their speech, God, as they speak at work, at school, at church, at home. My Lord, sanctify, anoint their houses. I pray from the moment they walk in their homes tonight that they'll be de begin declaring the things of God. Oh, I pray for heads of household. Men, listen to me now. I pray that you'll become warriors and leaders of your home, that you'll speak life and not death over your wife and your children. I pray before you go to bed at night that you'll declare God's blessings over your family for God's given you the authority to rebuke demons and devils and to cast out things that are not of him. Oh Lord, I thank you for the anointing on praying mamas. I thank you God that the women are becoming a voice of champions. Lord, that they will pray the prayer of faith and stand up for what's right and stand against what's wrong. I pray that as mamas speak into their children's lives that the children will listen with open hearts hearts and ears and say if mama believes it I believe it if mama says it's right I'll say it's right my God help our parents to become Holy Ghost filled warriors and I pray Lord that they'll walk in ways that are pleasing to you my God help me and Carol Ray to walk in ways that are holy and acceptable in thy sight I pray over every mother and daddy that God you would renew their passion for you and for one another and that God you raise up a church in Southside Alabama but by the name of New Haven that will please you in everything we do. And the church said, Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand. <laughs> Give the Lord a hand. Oh, God is moving. Boy, sometimes that anointing just, that anointing just comes over a shepherd to speak over his people. Oh, and I'm so thankful you allow me to be your shepherd. What an honor it is. Pray for my family and I'll pray for yours. Amen. Let's keep working together. Tomorrow night we've got an opportunity to impact a community. We're going to be meeting right out here. Have everything set up, please, by 6 p.m. And, and here's the thing. We're going to give out a lot of candy, a lot of food, a lot of drinks and chips. But I want you to give out a ton of love. 
Amen. I mean, there's some kids coming tomorrow night. They may not get supper sometimes. And it's not just physical uh, lack of wealth. There may be children who never step foot in a church. And I pray in the name of Jesus, my Lord, I'm still exhorting. In the, I've never spoken over this, over a trunk or treat like this, Brother David. But I'm here to tell you, I'm not saying go to preaching to everybody. Because that's not always appropriate. But I'm saying this. You show them what real... You show them what real church looks like. It looks like Jesus, Brother Ricky. When, when you hand them a piece of candy, let them know, God bless you. We own. Oh, you better watch it. Let them know, we love Jesus. You. That might be the first time in 365 days that a child has heard the words, we love you. You be the first. You be the, the example of Christ. Tomorrow night, everything we do, if you're having to do something you don't like, picking up trash, that kid shouldn't have thrown that bubble gum wrapper down. I'm going to get a hold of it. Instead of that, say, God, I'm doing it for your glory. I'm picking it up as unto the Lord because I want to be a servant. Amen. Are we in unity about that? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So tomorrow night, 6.30 is when it starts. We'll have uh, people setting up between 5.30 and 6. <clears throat> Many of you already know what you're supposed to be doing. We'll, we'll have people here uh, to show you where to park if you're bringing a trunk. Uh, you'll be on the back side of the property. And we've got everything set up. Ushers, we're still good on ushers. Brother David, he'll be directing traffic. We've got folks serving food, cooking food. Deanna and Hope, I think y'all are in charge as far as that. Uh, got some young people going to help you with sign-ins. So anyway, thank you, everybody who's involved. It, it can only be successful because of your help. Is there any other uh, thing to be said, announcements, anything?